Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dream Drop Long Distance, a podcast where two best friends less than subtly sneak the name of their show into conversations. I'm Kyle Branshaw, and as always, my dear friend Mitchell Orsino has decided to dream drop in from a long distance. How are you today, bud? <laughs> hey, buddy. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Also, very subtle way of adding the intro and the name into it. Thank you. Wink, wink. Uh, very well. Mm -hmm. Very well done, sir. Uh, but yes, uh, I've been looking forward to this episode quite a lot. Absolutely. I mean, honestly, I don't think that the listeners would remember the name of the show if I didn't dream drop it into our conversations. Yeah, that'd be quite a long shot. And they'd have to go quite the distance to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like explaining the joke, but I'll explain the joke anyway. To those listening, uh, the gag here is that on no less than five occasions, the cast of characters in this big conclusion of Chain of Memories decided to use the phrase Chain of Memories. They waited until the last maybe 15 percent of the game. Somebody that was writing this just went, oh, oh, no, we haven't actually like used the title of this at all and then they just started hammering it every chance they could <laughs> i mean honestly though wasn't the first kingdom hearts game the same way didn't we beat maleficent and then ansem showed up and started talking about kingdom hearts yeah yeah i mean it would really you didn't even know what that was until you got to the final boss so you're not wrong i, I feel like they have a habit of waiting until the end to give you that content. See, my original theory was that maybe like when the first time that someone said it, I was like, oh, maybe they were like, let's just use a cool line from the game as the title of our game. But then when they said it four more times, I was like, oh, there's no way that's true. <laughs> no, they are just they're just jerking us around at this point. Oh, dude, absolutely. Absolutely. I was very, very excited with this playthrough. I know we're both looking to it, looking forward to it. Because this technically is the end of this game. Yeah, yeah. So we have played through the the uh, the end of this. So there's some extra context. We might be you might be hearing this ad, but uh, this might turn into a double header for us because we're looking at it and it's like this might be two hours. Oh, it's heavy. But I don't want to put you through two hours all at once. No, no, no. We're gonna break. That. I think I agree. I think we break this up into two. I know we don't want to want to put you through you know, almost a feature length films worth of content here, because there is a lot to the light, the last little bit of this game. Yeah, like gameplay wise, like gameplay time wise, it wasn't that long. And yet so much happened that needs to be talked about. So uh, last we left off, we were handed a card for a world that we did not recognize, something that was created from the other side of Sora's heart. We don't know what that means. To this day, even with the context of later games, I still have no idea what that means. <laughs> we wind up going to this new world. And what is it called, Kyle? This world is called Twilight Town. So fans of the series may recognize that name, but let's pretend we don't know. How would you describe this place, Mitch? The, the main things that come to mind for me are, are the brick buildings and the architecture. This feels like an RPG city. But kind of modern, like there's a train that runs through town or a trolley, perhaps. To me, it's like picture a very earth tone German village, almost medieval that's been retrofitted to be modern. Almost like how they make, you know, these like these Christmas villages. Basically, like the, the buildings look old, but everything built around the buildings looks new. Like Kyle said, there's a monorail that goes by. There's neon lights. Um... The thing that really stands out to me, though, is the idea of like the twilight aspect of it, where sometimes when you look around, you'll notice that there's like a, a hazy light kind of fog, not an actual fog, but like all of the the light rays off of you and every other thing has a slight mysticism to it. That play on light that you get from uh, right on the edge of like twilight hour and which I think is such it's such a cool, subtle addition to the art style of this level. Yeah, that's that's a really good way of putting it. I especially liked the the Christmas village analogy. That's a that's a really fitting way to put it. But yeah, I never thought about it with all the mysticism. It's really interesting that it is just always twilight like this. Like I know it's literally called Twilight Town, but just that that golden hour that you're constantly in, it it's 
peaceful though, like very peaceful. And that peace is just matched by the music itself, which is mm-hmm. absolutely beautiful, but kind of haunting. Did you catch that vibe? Yeah, no, I, very much so. Like if you picture somebody going off to the afterlife and it's that, that song that's kind of playing them out, but it's not sad. It's like a, a last hurrah kind of thing. Yeah, purgatory almost too. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a very good term for it, purgatory. But then you're also immediately matched by much stronger Heartless and the much higher numbered card doors. <laughs> Twilight Town to me was yeah. the, intro- the introduction of the game went, hey, we hope you've been saving up every card you've ever owned. And also, uh, all the Heartless basically get like 50% more health. So have fun. Yeah. The weird thing that they don't tell you before playing through this section is that green cards stop dropping altogether. You only get red cards and blue cards. I mean, I get it because the green cards were just strong. There were no Mm -hmm. downsides to any of the green cards. No. But still, it's a little cheap and kind of weird. It was kind of dirty. And I will talk about it more whenever we get into the final world we're going to talk about because... When I say I was cutting it close, ooh, I was cutting it close. (laughs) Oh, man. So, turning to the characters, Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Jiminy, they're all looking around, and they do not recognize this place. And it's interesting, because at first, Sora's like, oh, no, there's no way I've been here before. And Jiminy's like, no, that can't be right. He said, this has to be from your memories. All the other ones were from your memories. So they kind of just accept that there's a chance that they've been here and just forgot it, which the player knows isn't true. And it's a weird uh, dichotomy happening there. Yeah. I mean, you're starting to see where they're becoming more open to letting these fake memories impede, which is like, ooh, that's kind of spooky. I still don't even know if this is a fake memory or Mm -hmm. if this really is from the other side of Sora's heart, just as Vexen said it was. Very true. I'll backtrack on them in a little bit, but... My guess is it's still fake. So, but yeah, speaking of fake memories, it goes right into uh, a discussion. Like Sora looks at Nominee's charm and, and has a, a memory flood back to him. He does. But then also the idea that he's like, as long as I've gotten this charm and he brings up, he's like, I'll always remember Nominee. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait. And that's the first time he says that that is Nominee's charm, not Kyrie's. Well, it never was Kyrie's charm, because remember, Kyrie's charm what was the was made from the Thalassa shells. Oh, I know, I know, but it's like now he's not even he it's just completely this is a nominee thing and no longer a Kyrie thing. And that is true. Yeah. That is so wild because of how strong their connection is in this game, in this series. And I mean Donald and Goofy just kind of roll with it. They're like, Oh yeah, you know, as long as you got that, you can find her. And I'm just like, no, they don't. They believe it, too. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of little details in the story, though, that really stood out to me. Like uh, Sora starts telling the story of when I think when he was given the charm, mm-hmm. which is there was this night of a meteor shower on the Destiny Islands. Yeah. And he's talking about how Namine was scared. Like, what if what if one of those shooting stars hits the islands and whatever? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's like, if a shooting star comes this way, I'll hit it right back in outer space. Okay, think with me for a second here. Didn't Kyrie arrive from Hollow Bastion to the Destiny Islands on the night of the meteor shower? I mean, according to the Kingdom Hearts 1 lore, yeah. So is Namine now inserting that she was there? I don't know, man. It's so wild. We don't have any any idea of like what's been who's being told what and what's happening and all this other stuff. But somebody is making some shit up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And to me, all signs so far point to Namine being the twist here. The person who's kind of like turning that. Oh, absolutely. They showed that pretty clearly when they uh, showed her drawing a picture in the last uh, in our last episode. There was a moment where she was drawing a picture and then immediately Sora started describing the scene that was in the picture. So I think what happens is she like draws something or I imagine that the the artistry is part of it. It could just be like a character quirk. But that's my thought is that like these these drawings that she does actualize into memories. 
Okay, so maybe she has to be able to visualize what she's making up before she can actually do anything with it. I, I mean, that's interesting. That's an interesting theory. I mean, wouldn't be the weirdest power we've seen in this series. So, <laughs> no, no, not by a long shot. No. So the only no. other detail we learn, the only other detail that we learn is that Namine left the islands at some point. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, you know, it's it's a fake memory, so it's not like that important. But that's weird to me that i guess they had they had to make it make sense somehow but they don't even really do it they just keep saying like and in one day she left or one day she had to go yeah and then i made a promise to keep her safe so it was all these like very vague but very large in scale like the idea of i'm gonna implant a memory that i left but not in, not the full memory of how i left or I, i'm gonna implant a memory in sora that he promised to protect me, but no context other than that. So he really has to, like, follow through with that because there's really no frame of reference for what I have to protect him from, yada, yada. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, she's really smart with this. Absolutely genius. Yeah. So moving on from that little uh, moment. So the next little tidbit that we get to see is that Sora ends up outside of a uh, mansion in the outskirts of twilight town of sorts mm-hmm. uh, another very familiar scene to fans of the series but for the player playing for the first time this is an odd location not really explained because we never we never we never go in right we just stay outside of the gates yeah and obviously you know we can't talk about it any more than that because we don't know any more than that mm-hmm. it's just a weird mansion at this point Yeah, but, you know, you walk up to it and Sora's kind of like, I don't really know this place either. And it's kind of the same situation where they're like, what has to have come from your memory? And he's like, no, he's like, I don't know this place. And then who shows up, Kyle? That, my dear friend, would be my mortal enemy, Vexen. He shows up this this weird little scientist guy. He shows up and he starts off simple, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, I'm, you know. He starts planting doubt about Namine into Sora's mind. Like, oh, can could those things really be real? The memory's wiles can be cruel. In its silence, we forget. In its obsession, it binds our hearts. But these sorts of things, I, I, I don't know what he's trying to do here. I don't know what his game is because... By hinting that Namine may not be telling the truth, he's definitely acting against Marluxia's wishes. Yeah. Uh, I know at one point he even tells him, he's like, are you sure that you're remembering this? It is, Or is it your heart that remembers? Which he's already said, he's like, he, he's pulling all of this from the other side of Sora's heart. At this point, it feels like he's just laying these little seeds of doubt to keep Sora on a particular path. And so, I don't, man, I just feel like there's like so many different groups that are pulling Sora in different ways that they want him to go right now. Yeah, and I feel like there's three different groups just inside of the organization itself. And then one other side of nominees will. Yeah, but we wind up having to fight this guy again. Because at this point, Sora now blames Vexen for Riku's change of heart as of late. Which is true because it, yeah, that's definitely Vexen's fault because Vexen's like, this is my Riku. So Sora's pissed and blames Vexen and they decide to fight. And they do. And oh my God. <laughs> Sora lost repeatedly over and over and over again. He kept getting back up and he lost and he got up again and he lost and he went and fought some more Heartless and he went back and fought Vexen and he lost. That is, uh, and that is where we're ending today's episode. Uh, so long, everybody. <laughs> It, it, guys, this fight is... It's ridiculous. This fight broke me. Uh, this uh, this fight broke us both. It, it was infuriating, and the amount of text messages that were shared cursing the digital soul of this character, and its mechanics, and its gimmicks, and it just... Ugh. Every fight up to this point, I've treated it as just a normal fight, this is Kingdom Hearts. I know how to play Kingdom Hearts. I can do this. No problem. You know, break their combos, you know, or break their slights, do some attacks of my own. No big deal. This guy right here, man. This guy. 
<sighs> I learned very quickly, and I had heard many a time as well, that there are decks that you can build in this game that are absolutely broken. And that's what I did. I built a deck that is broken as all get out through the power of slights. I will not lie. Kyle and I both got to the point where we had to cheese this man. It We're not we're not proud to admit it, but it needed to be done or we would never be able to record again. <laughs> no, or I would have spent like five levels just pumping HP and then maybe another five. Like I maybe could have beat this game at level 75 without this cheese deck. Maybe I could have beat this. Game. Maybe. But that was not going to happen. I did not feel like investing that level of time that and it was kind of cool just to see what a what a broken deck looks like. I, I feel like there's nothing wrong with a broken deck because no. if it works, if it works and you still have fun, it's a functional deck. Yeah. No, who cares? Absolutely. I mean, but no, continue, though, because Kyle did share this this deck with me and I I. 100% will admit that it does work and it works well. Yeah. So basically what I did was we filled our decks with trios that were ready to do the slight Sonic Blade, which lets you uh, just stab wildly around the map. You rush, 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 rush around and stab at your enemy. And it is a beautiful thing. And... We threw some zeros at the front of the deck to be able to break any slights that Vexen tried to use. Throw some high potions in there to get your slights back. Uh, and the most important part is at the beginning of each slight trio, there was a premium card because the whole thing with slights is that they burn the first card. That card does not come back on a reload. So throw premium there because premiums don't come back on a reload either. So it's like, oh, cool. Do both of those at the same time. Efficiency with your with your card points, your CP, as it were. Mm hmm. And then high potions get all of your cards back that wouldn't be reloaded otherwise. And then we just went to town on this guy, just stabbing him over and over and over again with Sonic Blade until he died. Yeah, it, I mean, I don't know about you. I had, I think, eight loaded up eight times I could use it in a row before I had to use an elixir or something like that to reload and then do it again. And once I, once I did that, barely touched me. I think he killed me one more time, and it's only because I slipped up, didn't use the right card once. He countered me, and it threw my entire rhythm off. Yeah, that'll happen. It does happen. Yeah, I, I had a I had a problem where my cures and my potions were backwards. Mm-hmm where uh, I, I had originally had it where cures were the first thing that came up after my slight trios. But what I needed to have was a potions first, because you want to grab a potion and then two cures, because the potion, no matter what, is going to get burned. You just cannot reload any type yeah. of item card. Those don't those just don't come back. So you may as well throw that as the first card of your slight and then two cures with for Cura. But uh, yeah, he got me a couple times with that. Yeah, but after that, we got him. We beat him. Uh, we can admit that we finally beat the bastard. And after you do, he he try he tries to act like he's not defeated because you can he's you can tell he's a very prideful person. Absolutely, and if, and Sora just wants Vexen to put Riku back. Yeah, at which point Vexen is just like, I can't put him back. Um, and then goes on to tell him, um, you know, says. If he keeps going the route he's going, he'll share the same fate as Riku. And if you keep going after Namine, all you're going to be is Marluxia's pawn. Yeah, yeah. And right when he says that, immediately in that moment, that is when Axel shows up. And Axel is on a warpath on Marluxia's orders. Uh, Axel is on a warpath and God dang kills Vexen dead. D-E-D -E -D dead. Well, so no, at first, Vexen just gets hit with a chakram and gets like laid out. And Witten and Axel kind of just like, oh, can't have you talking too much. And then Vexen is just like, why? And he obliterates this man. Like he cremates Vexen. And not like, you know, bloody gory. It's a, it's a, it's a Disney movie. It's a Disney game, kids. But roast this dude and then he just 
fades away into the ether. I love Axel's line here, which is just goodbye. Ugh, what a man. At which point Sora in his absolute just like, what the hell, turns and yells, what are you people? And Axel looks at him and goes, you know, I wonder about that myself sometimes. We're just nobodies. We're just nobodies. And just that line. Oh, so good. Ah, so you get done with that and Twilight Town's just kind of over all of a sudden. You you just kind of walk through a couple more rooms and you're out or not even a couple more rooms. I think it's just over right after that. Yeah, they just let you go right through. Yeah. So it's just like, oh, cool. That world's over. All right. Back to Castle Oblivion. Yeah. Overall, it was actually a really short world. Yeah, I mean, minus the part where we got our asses kicked by Vexen over and over again, I think we spent more time talking about it than we spent in it. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I'm guys, when I say I put the controller down at least once a day for about four days, because <laughs> oh, it was no. just, in, I, I was, I, Kyle would be like, how are you doing? I'm like, screw this. And he's like, OK, you're going to record later. <laughs> <laughs> If I knew that you were having that much trouble on the same part, I would have given you the, the trick that I used sooner because I, I took care of him same day. I was like, uh, uh-uh, this guy's going down. Well, I hadn't been keeping up with leveling and getting slights. So I had to level a couple extra times because I was like four slights behind and I didn't have it. Oh, oh, man. OK, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. So I had to do this this little rung of gameplay was probably the most like level farming I've done in this game yet. Wow. Oh, man. I have had to level farm for ahead of every single boss fight, like every boss fight that's in Castle Oblivion. So like I'll finish a world and be like, ah, cool. Okay, time to level up three more times before I go back out into the castle. Mm hmm. I feel like just naturally I I liked just clearing all of the like every room I walked in. I'm like, I wanted to beat all the heartless. So, yeah, for some reason, I it just I liked and I would just naturally level like that. But that was one where I was like, oh, damn, I'm like three or four levels behind. I really need to uh, do a little bit of grinding here. So we get done with that fight. We're out of Twilight Town. And what happens after that? Well, first, we see that Marluxia and Larkseen are watching us and Axel with a crystal ball. And uh, Axel shows up with them and this scene unfolds where Larxene and Marluxia try to recruit Axel into this splinter cell of the organization where they're trying to take it over from within. Mm -hmm. And something that they're doing about this needs Sora for this plan. And then they uh, he doesn't really like agree or disagree to it, I don't think. He just kind of like plays cool for a little bit longer, but you can tell that he's not actually going along with it. Yeah, no, he hasn't come out and said yes or no, but he does admit just being like, oh, so you guys had me kill Vexen to test whether or not I was on your side. And at that think Lark scene even brought up. She was like, we had to see if you had it in you. Yeah, man, clearly he did. He's whatever his goals are. He's really doing a good job of playing close to the chest about it from all sides, really. He he definitely is really good at playing the game. So then it cuts back over to uh, to Sora, who runs into a familiar face. Yep. Uh, Riku's back once again. And they get to talking and Riku brings up this this memory, this time about when he promised to nominate that he would protect her no matter what. At which point Sora's like, whoa, 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 hold on. He's like, when did that happen? He goes, back on the islands, this one night, there were these shooting stars. And Sora's like, hold on. He's like, and I told her that if they ever came down, I would knock them away. And Sora goes, with a wooden sword. And Riku looks at him, he goes, how do you know that? He's like, because I did the same thing. And Riku's like, no, you didn't. That's my memory. He's like, no, that's my memory. And you start to realize that these two are having the same memories all of a sudden. But then Riku gets upset and it's just like, you're lying. And as he goes to lunge at Sora, this glint where he, he his mind just snaps and he hits the ground, almost like he just got shot in the forehead and he just like a sack of potatoes. 
Yeah, that was an interesting moment for me. I really thought that that was going to be the moment that the illusion broke down and that Riku realized that he was being played or that Sora realized he was being played. But especially Riku, like the way that he doubled over, it really seemed like he was about to have a breakthrough. I thought the same thing, but he wound up just doubling down and and didn't believe that Sora could have the same memory as him. Which then uh, leads to a fight. As you do. Best friends have the same memory. Time to fight. <laughs> time to time to square up. Uh, but he doesn't. And he just hits the ground. Basically, you see his mind get tweaked and he kind of freaks. And he pulls out. He's like, she gave me this charm. And he pulls out a charm. And then Sora goes, wait, and pulls out. They have the exact same one. And that just pushes Riku over the edge. And he jumps in and a fight begins for about the fourth time in this game. (laughs) Yeah, honestly, like this is Sora and Riku fight the game, which is fine. I'm totally cool with it. I love I love uh, being able to simulate fighting my best friend and winning because I know it'll never happen in real life. Ah. Unless I stand on a chair, as we established back in Wonderland. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) hello. I I don't know who that. I don't know who you're talking about. Um. (laughs) But um, but anyway, yeah, a fight breaks out. And uh, now that we're all buffed up from fighting Vex and Riku goes down like an absolute chump. Oh, that was not even a fight. Yeah, which is our own fault. We broke the game, but we decided game. You're not playing fair, so we're not going to play fair. And we just flushed him. Yeah, it it wasn't it wasn't much of a fight. The cards I was seeing him use weren't really that strong. So I don't know if it had been that big of a fight to begin with. After Vexen, if they did make him a hard fight, people would be pissed. Oh, I'd have lost my mind. But then we do wind up beating him and he, you know, he takes off again. But he leaves his charm there. Yeah. And Sora walks over, picks it up, and it transforms into a card for the Destiny Islands. It does. The Destiny Islands, the home of Riku, Sora, Kairi, uh, and a couple other, you know, little C-list Final Fantasy characters. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the character whose name I finally remembered and could not have told you her name for the past 14 weeks, I could not have told you that her name was Selfie. Selfie. Selfie, yeah. Could not have told you her name. I I remembered her, I could never remember her name. But anyway. I could never forget that bob cut, man. Yeah, I can't forget her, but I always forget her name. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, (laughs) sidetrack, hello. Uh, I think what's really important in this moment, though, is that Donald starts asking some really hard questions to Sora about the fact that he and Riku shared this memory. He does. Like, Donald's like, how how do you know that your memory is the real one? How do you know his isn't? How do you know his isn't the real one? How do you know either of them is real? This is weird. Why do the two of you have the same memory? And you know what Sora does? Sora gets pissy about it. (laughs) Sora gets very childish about it and it's just like they're obviously mine and goofy i felt so bad from this goofy and donald were just like we're just trying to help you know we're trying to make sense of all this he's just like i don't want to make sense of it i'm illogical right now i'm hung up on this girl i've never met so you know what blah 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 and he runs off without them Yeah, which is so frustrating, but it needed to happen. Like good friendships have these moments where they break apart. They got to butt heads once in a while. They do, but also then the heartless get another ramp up in the next level and not having the ability to use those friendship cards. Man, some of those mobs were pretty whack without being able to like, you know, occasionally clear them out with like a Donald or Goofy combo. It ends up being worth it in the end, but we'll get there. There's a there's a good reward for it at the end of this. Oh, there's, there's I think a great reward for it. And I want to bring up one thing that there was a cutscene right before we got into the Destiny Islands. Axel goes to Namine and basically is like, if you don't stop this from happening, who will? And she's like, what do you mean? And he walks to the side 
of the room and is just kind of like because he's talking he's, he means more lucia right and he walks to the side of the room basically gives her the i mean i'm not gonna see if something happens and somebody runs out of the room wink wink nudge nudge marluxia doesn't seem to be around and she gets the hint and she takes off but axel looks up to the sky and tells someone starts talking to somebody in the sky and wonders how he is enjoying this yeah 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 yeah. i noticed that uh, um he says uh try and make it interesting for me and then just busts out laughing but i i think what's happening is that he's caught off guard by the fact that he's laughing and enjoying this moment yeah he was like he's like oh i'm feeling something and to me that was such a huge moment that i was like wait do they not normally yeah you caught that yeah yeah, and then right after that cutscene, there's one small little moment that plays out where it's just Sora and Jiminy, and Jiminy's like, "Oh, don't shouldn't we be concerned about Donald and Goofy and or something like that?" And Sora's just like, "Keep it to yourself." Yeah, he gets very very snippy with Jiminy. I was a little mad. I was like, "Jiminy has done nothing but help you during this for free, and you're being a complete douchebag to him." Yeah. I was like, wow, that he has just ostracized all of his friends very quickly for shame, Sora. But overall, I I didn't fight a whole lot on this level. I mean, I leveled up a couple times, but then I tried to kind of move through it pretty quick. It looks like the Destiny Islands, you know, little a little water area around bushes that you can whack and get like health and moogle points with palm trees, the wooden plank buildings and structures that you can tell these kids have built to make like look like tree houses and yada yada yeah one of the things i really enjoyed was the soundtrack actually like they really reorchestrated it they reorchestrated the song the destiny island song for this rendition of it for this level as compared to the original kingdom hearts which is something that i appreciate that they do between games like the the opening track that plays in the main menu that's different here than it was in kingdom hearts one it's different in every single game they che- they tweak it up a little bit and change the instruments and orchestration and i really appreciated the the chill and jazzy vibe that they brought here i love the music of this and the atmosphere and you know you're greeted by uh sophie titus and waka who they start to joke around and they're like oh hey well you should go meet up with her and he's like what are you talking about and they're like oh yeah don't worry we'll We'll go hang out somewhere so you guys can be alone with her. And it's just like, all right, guys, like y'all are being a little on the nose here. Um, And Sora wanders off. Sora doesn't even recognize them, <laughs> which is crazy. No, he doesn't. He doesn't really. He just it's kind of like, oh, hey, guys. <laughs> but then he winds up finding Riku. But this isn't the Riku we've seen during the entire game. This is original Kingdom Hearts 1 destiny islands riku uh, black tank top yellow blue overalls like it looks like the the og guy that's a good point that's a good point yeah it's, it's got his like actual design rather than the the heartless overtaken version of riku that we've been seeing yeah you know sora finds him but he realizes very quickly that this is the riku from his memories and then all of a sudden the ground starts to rumble and the island takes off Yes, it, it, we're starting to see that fall to darkness, just like what happened in the first game. Yeah. Even though there's no yeah. real cause for it this time. No, they there really isn't. Um, but who who do we fight, Kyle? Well, we fight the classic dark side boss, the uh, the boss that looks vaguely like Sora, sort of, kind of. He was really easy, but I couldn't use the same strategies that I used against the other bosses. But as soon as you recognize that if you jump up, and attack him in the head he goes down so fast like he has almost no health when you when mm-hmm. you're attacking something other than his hand yeah he uh this one obviously the 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 boss beating deck that we had found and been using wasn't quite working but as long as you had cards valued six to nine and could just keep whacking him in the head he was he was nothing it was so easy it almost wasn't fun but that's okay they, they put it in there for the throwback well, there also just wasn't like a lot of content to him. He just like appears and then that was kind of it. And then he didn't even really have a gimmick. It was basically this the same thing that he's done in all the other games. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. 
There was a small gimmick they added, like uh, just like most of the other world bosses, you could pick up a Mickey Mouse card. Oh, yeah. And what that did here is that it just like added platforms you could jump up onto so you could be on his level and attack him. Yada, yada. Yeah, you're right there. You're right. But what happens after we beat him? Namine shows up. Sora is confronting the Namine that has been uh, infecting his memories versus the real one who's out in Castle Oblivion trying to undo the damage that she's done to Sora's heart and mind. Yeah, and specifically we had one who apparently was an like an actual memory and the other one who showed up after specifically being like Sora that's not me that's the me that you think you know and so he's just getting absolutely tugged in two different directions and has no idea which one to believe yeah which drives him crazy and it's so bizarre one thing that i found was really interesting here is that Namine mentions that she was lonely for so long and just couldn't bear it anymore and that that was the reason why she called out to Sora's heart and lured him to Castle Oblivion it's so odd to see this play out but also like how long has Namine existed or been alone is Namine actually the same age as everyone else does she just appear to be that way there's a lot of questions with her that is a very good question and one that we do not know the answer to honest to god I do not (laughs) I have no idea but we do have a little glimpse of Sora's actual love interest but he can't remember her god dang name he can't cannot remember her name and therefore we will not say it. no he, he no. can't remember Kyrie's name and it's so sad it's crazy but it, you know he sees her face and he's like there's that girl he's like I'm not sure who she is I just know that she's important and that's so wild and yeah. after that which I want to preface really quickly we do get a new keyblade card which is the oath keeper very important and very on brand for for what's happening within Sora's heart. But also like, yeah, that is that is kind of the Destiny Islands Keyblade, if you think about it. It is. It is very fitting point to get it. So with that, Sora goes back out into Castle Oblivion and finds the real nominee. And right when she's about to start explaining what the hell's been happening, because now there's only one nominee to talk to instead of two. Riku shows up again, again, dude, just (laughs) because Sora actually tells her, he's like, hey, you aren't the person that I care about. Like, I have a memory of caring about you and promising to take care of you, but I know that you're not the person, basically. And when Naminé goes to admit it, Riku just steps in and just like, you don't have to explain anything. And it's like, Riku. God, dude, just give up. And they get another slight argument and Sora and Riku have another fight. That's that's a fun way to put it. A slight argument. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm making a point to try to to do these little bit of like inserts into this stuff for this episode. So I feel like I'm doing okay. Look at you dream dropping these references into our episode from such a long distance. Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, keep, okay anyway we wind up beating riku down for about the sixth time in this game and sora goes to tell him something riku actually blasts him with like a, the power of darkness all of a sudden as he's going to lay the final hit we see that that spark on his forehead that kind of mental just snap and he just hits the ground like a sack of bricks that you can see his eyes pretty much roll back in his head and he just plops like a and i thought riku died oh no and i was like oh what just happened and nominee was like i i had to stop him yeah you get and who shows up actually that's a better question who shows up after that well lark scene shows up at this moment and she continues this this uh, trouble that you're in by saying that Naminé just now smashed Riku's heart. Which you're like, she can do what? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which is wild. Like, how is that even possible? But the whole thing was actually ruined for me because when you defeat Riku in that last fight, you are given a card, you know, one of the normal heartless cards, or whatever the enemy cards that you can put in your deck. Mm -hmm. And it says Riku replica. I know. I know. I really wish it wouldn't have said that. Yeah, because the whole everything that happened here of like, oh, no, what happened to Riku or oh, my God, what is happening? Oh, my God, the real Riku is going to kill us. He, he's going to kill Sora. Yeah. All of that's kind of undercut by the reveal that, oh, Riku replica. All right, whatever. So but Sora doesn't know any of that. So he takes it very personally right in that moment. See, that's funny. That's how you felt about it. I I think it just doubled down on my emotion of like. Holy shit, Riku's dead. And I saw that. I was like, wait, what Riku replica? Hold on. What is this? And then when they started going in, I was like, oh, OK. So I think we had two different emotional rides there, which I find that's very interesting. Oh, man. I, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Oh, oh, OK. Never mind. OK, that means it hasn't been Riku all along. No encounter that Sora has had with Riku in this castle has been real. Yeah, this is crazy. I'm kind of disappointing in its own way. Yeah, kind of. I think in some ways, you know, but then Lark scene basically outs Naminé as a memory witch. Like some she is able to twist and bend and break and replace the memories of people. And that is her power. And that is what is she that's what she's been doing to Sora this entire time. And Sora kind of still doubles down on the idea of like, I don't care. Like I told her I would protect her. And... Larkseen is just like, dude, I'm just going to put your little simp and self out like you're not even this is just getting ridiculous. And then what happens? So I'm going to pause for a second, because for one, Larkseen does reveal that Riku is a puppet in this moment right here. Like for one, Larkseen kicks the hell out of Sora, which is wow. Yeah. And then says that, you know, this Riku is just a puppet that Vexen made as an experiment, no more than a toy. And then picks up Riku's limp body in a way that's both unnerving and mildly interesting. She does hum him like a puppet. Like she does. So she says, like, I'm going to blame, you know, blame it all on Naminé. Um, but Sora winds up being like, well, I'm still not giving up on my promise to her. And this is while he's like clutching his chest from just getting boot kicked in the sternum by Larxene. And she pulls out her daggers and is just like, you're not even worth it anymore. I'm done with this. And as she goes to attack him, what happens? Naminé runs in there to protect Sora. And then Larkseen slaps the hell out of her. Just backhand. Backhand right there, man. Also, we have to point out that she admits and says that Marluxia made Naminé do this. That's true. That is important because that gives uh, some some trust back to Naminé, who uh, Sora had definitely just offended not too long ago. Yeah, but Larkseen does just like run the gauntlet on everybody in that room. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It, it, we would be in some major trouble if Donald and Goofy didn't show up right in that moment. Couple of freaking champions. Yeah, these are my boys right here, man. They know that even though Sora has definitely just hurt their feelings in a major way, he still needs their help. And they're not just going to abandon him because of a couple words exchanged. They show up and they heal uh, Sora and they absolutely wipe the floor with Larkseen because, again, we've fought Vexen and now nothing is a challenge anymore. <laughs> yeah it's such a cool moment where as she's going to lay the final blow on sora a shield flies out of nowhere and smacks her and she's like basically just like what the hell and all of a sudden a little heel bell appears over sora and donald and goofy all i can describe it as is if you've ever seen an anime or any of the marvel movies or your main hero is just getting the floor waxed by his floor wax by somebody else. And as he thinks there's no hope to his left and right from somewhere appear his two best friends or his two, his first mates, his brothers in arms, and they just destroy through the power of friendship. 
that which they could not have done alone. And it was awesome. And for it to be a Donald and Goofy moment just made it that much better. Absolutely. We we really turned the tables on her. And then, surprisingly, Lark scene fades into nothingness. We've killed her. Not just defeated. We've killed her. Yeah, she pulls a Vex and, and just she kind of is like, I can't be fading. I can't be doing that. And then she just pff, into nothing. Which is kind of morbid in its own way. I don't think Sora's like killed somebody like that before. He doesn't like it. You can tell he doesn't like it. Yeah, but then again, at the same time, Axel keeps referring to himself and the the group of the organization as nobodies. So, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter as much as we think it does, but I don't know. It's kind of dark. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's it's a weird thing. But they do. They wind up having a a whole conversation after that. And Nominee admits that, yeah, Marluxia did make me do it. And this is like why he's making me do it. And Sora's like, you know what? Well, we're still going to help you no matter what. And probably one of my favorite moments of this entire thing is Donald and Goofy make fun of Sora. And they'd be like, oh, don't worry. You always are like this around girls. And Sora's like, oh, come on. And they both just bust out laughing because they've just outed Sora for not being good with women. Yeah, that was so funny. My my favorites were actually um, Goofy walking up and saying, Hello, you must be nominee. I'm Goofy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I loved watching that so very much. And then Sora going on that whole spiel, right, about how how he's going to continue to keep his promise to nominate, even though it was a false memory and all of that. He's still keeping his promise. Right. Yeah. But also being forgiving to nominate for all of that. He's, he's going through that whole thing. And Donald's like, oh, brother, that's a bit much. <laughs> 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 yes he, he's just like oh my god you were trying way too hard and it's so funny especially from donald who you know who's probably the only one in this group that's actually been in a relationship right yeah that's true he does have daisy you're right uh it just feels like it's a very big brother moment of donald being like it's like oh sora buddy you're just trying you're trying too hard you're trying too hard and it's 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 so cute Oh, it's so freaking funny, man. I love that moment. Yeah. And uh, the last thing that we're going to talk about on this episode, though, uh, Mitchell and I are going to keep going for a little bit longer, I believe. But uh, for for where we're going to take a break, I should say, uh, the last yep. thing that happens is uh, they're running off onto the 13th floor, uh, running down the hallway. And Donald starts kind of getting scared of losing memories at this point, which honestly is terrifying when you really do think about it. And Goofy decides that the best way to hold on to your memories is to make a promise that's so super duper big in his words that you can't forget it. And you have to keep courageous to be able to continue to keep that promise. So they make a, a promise to each other and that unlocks a wonderful ability. Tell us about it, Mitchell. Oh, my goodness. This is so much fun to have. So the guys make this promise and they put their hands on top of each other and you get the trinity limit ability the power of their friendship is so strong that you now get this by using a combo of donald goofy then sora yeah it's donald goofy and sora um you basically summon forth this eldridge arcane magic and you wipe the field and uh, yeah. mo I mean, this is more through uh, heartless battles. It's it'll work on bosses, but rarely. Um, yeah, no, every, every time I tried it in a boss battle, it got broken. So, yeah, I did. It didn't even make sense to me. I tried it a couple times and it was it was weak. But for heartless grinding and other things like that. Excellent, especially because Castle Oblivion level like 13th floor. Man, the heartless do not pull punches. Not at all. But that we will get there. Uh, for you guys next week for us here in about two minutes but uh, for today <laughs> for for you all today uh, this is where we're gonna take a pause and we're gonna pick up with castle oblivion the big finale of yes. sora's adventure here within castle oblivion are you excited mitchell yep. do you know where we're going next i am i'm not gonna say it but i am so excited to do 
to finish this game. Like this, this storyline has beaten my expectations by a mile. Yeah, I'm just I'm ready to I'm ready to talk about this last bit. Oh, so ready. But like Kyle said, we are trying to keep it to a certain time limit and we will have to catch you guys on the next one. Absolutely. Thank you all for listening. We will talk to you next week. See you then. Hey there, Kingdom Hearts fans. Thanks for listening to the episode. Dream Drop Long Distance is hosted by Mitchell Orsino and Kyle Bradshaw and is produced by Kyle Bradshaw. Our theme music was written and recorded by Alex McLean.